With that, let's bring in Duncan Levin. He's a former Manhattan DA who specializes in criminal law, also have years of experience at the DOJ and in the DA's office, which is behind us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Um, yeah, uh, so we got some news out of yesterday. Not a big bombshell, but the fact that no jurors were picked, um, that seemed quite notable because that seems to be the, the big task at the moment. I want to get to Trump's comments in just a moment, but just the fact that there were no jurors selected. What do you make of how this process is playing out? I think that that's absolutely normal at this point because what a lot of people don't realize is that these pretrial motions are extremely important to the trial. So a lot of the things that the judge is talking about um, yesterday with the defense attorneys and with the prosecutors are what types of evidence can be introduced at the trial. So what gets in, what doesn't get in, um, and the contours of the trial, what the instructions to the jury is going to look like, what the lawyers are allowed to say. So all of that is really important. Important. It's just a very routine part of a case. This case, obviously, um, is much like other cases. And so this is something that happens before the jury selection. I think they're going to get started today now that all of that's been resolved. It's like other cases, but a defendant like no other. And even that questionnaire has some questions on there that are like, have you attended a Trump rally? Are you affiliated with the Proud Boys? Things like that. Does that make it suggest to you that it could be more difficult to find a jury of 12? There's no doubt that it's going to be more difficult to find a jury in this case. On the other hand, the DA's office is no stranger to high-profile cases. This is in a class of its own. Obviously, Trump is like no other defendant who's ever been tried in this courtroom, and we all, this courthouse, we all know that. But at the same time, the process itself is going to play out like it has thousands and thousands of times a year in these courthouses, um, and, and it's going to be very routine in a way to pick a jury. It's just going to be a little bit harder to find jurors who don't know anything about the defendant, who haven't weighed in on the case or weighed in on the defendant himself and themselves. And I understand we have uh, live pictures now of former President Donald Trump walking out, getting ready. He's making that uh, four-mile trek uh, from Midtown Manhattan, from Trump Tower all the way down to the building right behind us, the courthouse in Lower Manhattan, for yet another day. We meet every day, every weekday, except Wednesday. Day and, and Mr. Trump is required to be here uh, because it is a criminal trial. Let's talk about this gag order. He's going on the attack once again. The judge put it in place because of his attacks. If it were to be any other person, me, you, or anybody else saying this stuff on social media, would there have been punishment by now? Yes, unequivocally, yes. And also, um, there's no defendant who would have four open criminal cases who wouldn't be remanded either. There's so much about this case that is different than every other case. It's in a class of its own. Um, the the former president's comments um, over this weekend definitely violated the gag order. There's just no doubt about that. And so the question is, what's the judge going to do about it? He's put over argument for it for another week or two. Um, I suspect he will do something about it. I, the DA's office is asking for a small fine. I don't know whether that's something that would be um, enough to have him stop doing it. The, the, the um, comments continue to come out on his social media in violation of the gag order. So we'll see what the judge is going to do about it. But I do think it's something that he has to take seriously because of the threat of physical violence that's been made against not only the judge and his family, but the members of the DA's office. And I'm sure prospective jurors are thinking that right now. Hey, what am I getting myself into? And through your time in this office back here, you've gone before Judge Juan Mersan. You know about him, his personality. What are the viewers at home? Like, just give us some bullet points on his demeanor. He's been described as kind of a drama-free judge. He is right down the middle. There is no drama with him, and he has a very tight control of his courtroom. He's going to be somebody who's not going to let politics get involved in any of this. And so I think as the jurors are going to come in and start um, answering questions, I don't think it's going to matter very much to him whether someone's a Democrat or a Republican or voted for Biden or voted for Trump. Those types of things don't mean that you can't be a fair and impartial juror. What it means, actually, is that um, he's going to play it down the middle of the line and really look for people who can just say that they can be fair and, and open and receptive to the, the evidence that's at hand. And if you're in the DA's office, what type of jurors are you even looking for? You're looking for jurors who can come in and say that they are fair. Obviously, the... the Manhattan as a county, which is what's drawing all these jurors, is overwhelmingly Democrat. And so it's not going to be a surprise that almost everyone on the jury voted for Biden. I don't think that the DA's office really cares very much about that at all. They're looking for jurors who can be fair, who don't have anything in their records that is going to have any conviction here overturned on appeal. So they're going to be looking for people where there's really no skeletons in their closet when it comes to Trump. So for the next two weeks, we're going to be pouring over the jury selection potentially, but there will be a point 
where we get to the actual substance of this case. Uh, the former president is accused of falsifying business records in connection with that hush money payment made uh, during his 2016 presidential campaign. What do you make of the strength of the case right now? And if you were on the defense, where would you try to be poking holes? Well, the case itself is going to be a mix of some boring testimony about falsifying business records and ledgers of the Trump organization and interspersed with cooperator testimony. And I think the strongest part of the defense case is really the cooperators. And Michael Cohn in particular is a terrible witness for the DA's office. The DA's office doesn't get to pick and choose their witnesses. They take the crimes and then they take the witnesses that come with the crimes. If they were going to pick their own witnesses, they'd pick the Pope. They wouldn't pick Michael Cohen. So I think there's a lot of room for attack from the defense about who these witnesses are, what they have to say, and their credibility. Because Michael Cohen, remember, has been convicted and charged and, and accused of lying in federal court. So they have a lot to work with there. But at the end of the day, um, the false records charge is what the case is about. And I think they have that in spades uh, as to the actual records themselves. How do you prove intent? Because he had to prove intent that he's trying to cover up other election crimes. It's circumstantial. You know, what they say to a jury is that if you um, come into a room and you're dripping with water and you have an umbrella and um, you shake it off and you have rain boots on, can you circumstantially say it's raining outside even if you don't actually see the rain? It's hmm. circumstantial, but I think the intent is read in from all of the evidence that you get of the false records. You say, well, why are these records being falsified? Is it for purposes of taxes? Is it, purposes, is it for purpose of actually interfering with an election and not having bad news? come out before an election, and I think the jurors are being called upon to use their common sense to be able to read between the lines, and that really is what circumstantial evidence is, and that's what this case is. It's going to be fascinating to uh, watch it all unfold. Deca Duncan Levin, former Manhattan DA, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you thank coming you on the show. Much.